The Middle East is faced with inflation, political and social challenges, displaced people, and disillusionment with the region's predominant religion. Yet, in the midst of the turmoil, the spirit of the Lord is at work. One of our partners leads a network of trainers who help start small Bible study groups that meet primarily in homes. There are now over 28,000 groups meeting in 15 countries, even in countries that are officially closed to Christian activity. Another partner reaches out through social media, receiving millions of views. Venture is helping them purchase and renovate a media center that will house a studio for creating media content. It will feature a training facility, cafe, and a call center to follow up with the thousands of new contacts that are generated monthly through social media. This past year, we budgeted $78,000 for humanitarian aid in the Middle East and sent another $15,000 from our COVID fund. Today, we are honored to hear from Brother Rashid. He was born to a conservative Muslim family in Morocco and had one sixth of the Quran memorized by age six. At the age of 19, he converted from Islam to Christianity after studying the differences between the two faiths. For years, Brother Rashid hosted a broadcast program to reach Muslims for Christ, a program so successful that it was banned in several Muslim countries in the Middle East. Now, his YouTube views measure in the millions. Please welcome Brother Rashid. Thank you, thank you. Well, good morning. My name is Rashid, as you heard, and I was born and raised in Morocco. I was here three years ago, and then COVID came, and this is my first time after COVID. I'm going to share something today about uh, God between Islam and Christianity. Many people ask me, do we worship the same God? And if you want to understand Islam and Christianity, you have to study the character of God in both religions. One of the things that influenced my life is the image of God in Islam and the image of God in Christianity. And actually, whatever image we have in our minds or the lack of influences every detail in our lives, our societies, our governments, our leaders, even our families. So what I'm going to share is just like some condensed um, version of what I call it, the God I didn't know. And I will start with a verse from John 8, 32. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You know, when I started comparing Islam and Christianity, I had, I believed in a God, in a certain God. I believed in his characters and attributes but those influenced in my life negatively. And then I started discovering the new God through the gospel and TWR, the radio program that I was corresponding with. Let me share some things that I knew about God in Islam. We have been taught that God in Islam has 99 names. We call them the most beautiful names. When you go through them, there is nothing about love. There are some beautiful names. He's the merciful, for example. But there are some terrible names, like the one who leads astray, the one who deceives. And those, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize it. My dad asked me, my dad was an imam of a mosque, and he asked me to memorize them. I still memorize the whole 99 names because he told me whoever memorizes those names goes to paradise. I loved God in Islam, I didn't know any better. He is also the most high. You know, in Islam there are seven heavens and there is the throne of God and he sits there and he's separated from us. And that's why when we pray, we pray down, we bow down because the more you are distanced from, him, from, from God, the more he gets glory. You are the most closer to God when you put your nose on the, on the ground. That's when you are closer to God. He will never come down to us on earth. He will come at the third part of the night to the first heaven and he will try to listen to us and to our prayers. That's the lowest he can get to. He can do whatever he wants. Some people told me like that's the same in Christianity. No, it's not the same. 
God in Islam can do whatever he wants, even things that contradicts himself. He can deceive people. He can lead them astray. He can dictate that on their lives. And then when I started studying the gospel, I found out that God is love. You know, probably you take it for granted. You heard it a million times in churches, but for me, it shook me. What does it mean? God is love? He's my father? That shook my life. Imagine I was 12 years old and the first time in my life I hear God is love. He's the source of all loves. The love to my family, the love to my dad, the love to my um, society, the love to my neighbor, and that the love to, for, my li- for my wife, for my kids, for everybody around me. He's the source of that love. I didn't, I didn't study that in Islam. And he left, he, not only he loved me, he left his glory for me. He came down to me. He became a human being. Imagine the first time you hear that. You hear that God whom you thought like he's distanced there, he's above his throne, he will never come down, then you hear something else. He's so humble, he came to me to save me. The other thing, he can do whatever it takes to save, even the cross. That shook my life, that changed my perspective. I was studying from 12 until 16 or 17 correspondence courses, and as I was learning the character of God and Christianity, everything changed in my life, everything, every detail. The other thing, the God I knew, he made me think I'm just a slave. You know, in Islam, we have so many names in the Arab countries, the slave of, the slave of the merciful, the slave of the holy, the slave of. We have no sons. I'm just a slave. That's what I can be. And then he made me scared. I always thought when I was a kid, and because we have to pray, we have to fast, otherwise God will punish us, uh, will punish us. I always thought of God as a big man who has a stick watching us. I was scared of him. I just did prayers, so I will do your prayers, I will do your fasting, and just leave me alone. He made me full of hatred for non-Muslims. We hated Christians and Jews. And that's clearly stated on the, in the Quran and the, and the sayings of Muhammad as well. One day I was going with my dad to a market, a local market, and the French people, they came in buses and they come usually visit and they spend some time, take pictures and they go to the next stop. So I was going with my dad from our village and I saw a nice bus with beautiful girls and taking their cameras, ladies and men with shorts and we are just walking to the, to the market and I asked that, I said, who are these people? He said, those are the Christians, Nasara, he called them, from Nazareth. And I said, those that God hates? He said, yes. I said, but why they look better than us? And it was like a very simple logic question from a kid. And then he looked at me and he said, don't worry about it. They have this life, we have the other life. Well, sounds good. But the thing in my heart, I always distanced myself. Those are the kafar, the people that God hates. I never had a love for Christians or, or Jews. Then my perspective started changing. He told me I'm not a slave. When you read the gospel, Jesus told, uh, he told us that he will not call us slaves. We are sons. Amen. I, I was moved. I am the son of God himself. Yes, I am his son. I mean, believe me, probably you heard it a million times. It doesn't mean anything to you. But as a kid, I was jumping. I am his son, yes. I'm not just a slave, yes. Our relationship is not a master and a slave, no. He's your daddy. 
You don't have to be afraid of him. He made me feel safe. I never, when I started studying Christianity, I felt safe with Jesus. I felt safe praying. I didn't have anything to fear. He made me love everybody, including enemies. When I read the, the, the Gospel of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, I was moved by the words of Jesus when he told me to love everybody, including our enemies. That doesn't exist in Islam. We should not love non-Muslims, period. We should not take them as friends or allies. The God I knew, he wanted me to kill, uh, he wanted to kill me if I stopped praying. You know, so many people, even Muslims, I, I discuss with them, I debate with many sheikhs, clerics, until today, many of them, they don't know this, that if you stop praying in Islam, the punishment is to be killed. They warn you, if you don't repent, then you have to be killed. All the four schools in Islam, they agreed on this. He wanted to cut my hand when I steal. Stealing in Islam, if you steal anything above an egg, like the value of an egg and above, your hand should be cut, amputated. He wanted to stone my mom or my daughter or my wife or me or my dad, anybody who sinned, who committed adultery. If he is married, if she's married, then they have to be stoned. That's the punishment in Islam. He wanted to cut my head if I leave him. Actually, apostasy, if you leave Islam like myself, the punishment is to be killed. I remember many times I had some debates and discussions with my dad. Some of them, they were very tough, very emotional. When I became a Christian, he told me one day, he said, Rashid, why you did this to me? I am the Imam, I'm like the pastor of a church. What do I tell people? They tell me, go preach to your son, he left Islam. You brought my head down, you embarrassed me. You brought shame on us. I just looked at him one, one day and I, was, I had tears in my eyes and I said, Dad, what Islam asks you to do? And he said, what do you mean? I said, yes, what Islam asks you to do in this case? He said, you know it. I said, no, I wanna hear it from your lips. He said, to kill you. I said, please do it, go ahead. I don't wanna suffer anymore, just do it, I'll forgive you. And he looked at me scared and he said, Rashid, do you think I will do it? And I said, why? That's what Islam asks you to do. I said, I can't. I said, why? He said, I'm your father. And I said, see, you have a heart, but the God you worship doesn't have one. And this is, this is the sad thing in Islam. Muslims are victim of their doctrines. And it's our duty as Christians to reach out to them and change their perspective about God. The other thing, the God I didn't know, when I read the gospel, he said he's at the door knocking. If I stop praying, like in Islam, I ask the same questions. What if I stop praying in Christianity? He said, I'm at the door knocking. Whoever hears my voice opens the door. I come to him and he's with me. We will have dinner. He will not kill me? No. He forgives a person when they repent. Let's say you steal. I mean, the law, that's a separate thing, but God forgives when we repent. And he said to the woman who sinned, go and sin no more. They wanted to stone her like Islam, but he didn't. He stays at the door waiting for me to come back. Let's say I wanna leave Christianity one day. The punishment is not death. He taught us, Jesus taught us in the Gospel of Luke that he will, he will be, uh, God will be like a daddy waiting for his son to come back so he can hug him and run actually to him and bring him back. That's a different image of God. It's not what Islam teaches. 
the God I knew made my dad against me. The most hurting thing in my life that I never imagined is to see my family against me. Family is a place of protection, place of love. That's where you feel safe. Imagine I'm 16, 17 in my life and then my family just rejects me. I'm homeless for two years. I felt pain. I felt a deep pain in my heart. And why they did that? Because they believe that's how they are serving their God. They are doing the right thing. The image of God had an influence on them. My, made my family reject me. Even the distanced family members, I went some nights trying to sleep and everybody just kicks me out one after the other. You became a Christian, you have no place among us. He made my country persecute me. I was interrogated many times by the secret police. I was threatened by death. I was threatened by fake accusations. One time they told me we will put drugs in your store and then you will have to face criminal charges. I was afraid. Why they are doing that? Because they want to protect Islam. They have, they have in their mind, they have a duty to serve their God. And that's how they protect Islam. The God I didn't know, he made me pray for my dad to get him back. In 2016, I discovered that my dad had cancer, lung cancer. I flew him in. I spent one month with him in the hospital, the last month in his life. We read the gospel, we prayed together, and he gave his life to Jesus Christ at the end. And he told me literally, forgive me, because I didn't know any better. I didn't have the knowledge. So again, Muslims are victims of their own doctrines. He made me win my sisters and brothers. We are seven siblings. Most of them now are believers. We're just praying for one of them. Even my mom, she left Islam now, and she doesn't say what she believes, but I believe she's a Christian because she says, to me, I pray to God secretly between me and him and nobody has to interfere in that relationship. And I said, amen to that. Now, even when Morocco rejected me, I left Morocco in 2005, not willingly because I was afraid that my wife or me, something would happen to us. But the best thing happened out of it. I started a TV program and I'm reaching to more Muslims now than before. And actually God gave me a bigger family like you, even though my extended family rejected me and I'm thankful that I have a bigger family now. The God whom I know now, I love him because he literally set me free. Amen. I imagine now if I wasn't, I w if I didn't hear the message of the gospel that day on the radio, what was going to happen to me? In Morocco, there, there were like probably 3,000 people who joined ISIS. From Tunisia, the same number or more. I imagine if I didn't have that chance to hear the gospel, I would have been ended somewhere else. And actually when you see terrorists killing or beheading, they are not, they are human beings like us. They have hearts. But they think that's how God wants them to serve him. The problem is the image of God in their minds. If they had a better image of God, they would not have been terrorists. 
I love my God because he changed me completely. I'm a new person since I believed in Christ. I love God because he literally saved me. You know, the liter- the salvation literally happens every day in the Muslim world. Not, not just saved eternally, saving people from death, saving people from suicide, saving people from uh, terrorist groups, saving them from different things in their lives. I hear stories all the time. One of the stories that I shared this weekend with our Arab community when I served uh, last night and the night before, a person called me from, he's Moroccan, and he was in Turkey for a certain period. He was recruited by ISIS when he was 17. He went to Turkey, then to Syria. He was in Idlib, a stronghold for ISIS. He spent one month indoctrinated, one month weapons. And then they sent him to the front. He said almost 80% of his friends died on the front. So he went back and then he started asking questions. What are we doing? Why we are doing it? Why our emirs, emir is the leader, why our emirs are enjoying best cars, enjoying money, enjoying girls, and we are fighting for them in the front. So when, when his leaders heard that, they put him in prison for three or four months. And then they asked him to go to another place and they didn't, they didn't wanna kill him at first, but since he refused to obey them after that, they started chasing him, so he went back to Turkey. He went to the Moroccan embassy and he said, I want to surrender. I did a mistake in my life, but I want to go back to the country. They hired him as um, an agent for them. He said, like, just stay in touch and spy on your friends. He said, but I want to go back. They said, no, you have to do this for us in order to get you back. So he did it for a while. And while he was doing it, he was... He had a lot of time going on YouTube and he found me. And when he found my videos, that changed him completely. One day he sent me an email and he said, thank you. One word. So I sent an email, I said, thank you for what? And he sent me a phone number. I called that phone number and he said, thank you for saving my life. I said, how? He said, when I start watching your videos, I realized the problem is not in ISIS, the problem in our doctrines it's itself. He became a believer, he got baptized. I told him, get a lawyer and get your life back. That's how Jesus is saving my people in the Middle East, in North Africa. One more story, it's in Saudi Arabia, Fatima. She's Egyptian, but she lived all her life in Saudi Arabia. She had two girls. And then they study Sharia, they study Islam. And one time I, I was in Canada, and then after I finished, she came to me, she hugged me, and she was crying for a few minutes. And I said, what happened? She said, I want you like somewhere, and I want to tell my story. I said, sure. I went there, and she said, I was watching you while I was in Saudi Arabia. On the, on the satellite. I say, and then she said, every time, whatever you say, it just sinks in. And one time I heard that we have to give our lives to Jesus Christ to get saved, so I prayed with you on TV. And then one time an Algerian called you and you told him you have to get baptized. And the Algerian said, I have no church around me. You told him, go to your friends who are believers and let them baptize you in a bathtub. She said, so I went to the shower and I turned the shower on. I put the hand on me and I said, I baptize you, Fatima, in the name of the Father and Son the Holy Spirit. I was laughing. I said, you created a problem for theologians. I don't know how they will, they will solve it. But I'm glad you did that. (laughs) Of course, she joined the church and she said, my two daughters are saved now and my son as well. 
It's amazing what's happening now in the Middle East and North Africa. It's a wave I have never heard or read or seen in my life. Many Muslims are searching for the truth. Many Muslims are seeking. It's our duty as Christians to, to give them the right image of God. Muslims love God, but they have the wrong image about him. This is what we have to know. So when we preach Jesus to them, that changes them completely. And that's why I like to share John 8, 36. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus is saving millions in the Middle East. I can share, I, I, I said last night, if, if I write a, a, a big volume about the stories I heard in my life of people getting saved, it will not be enough. I still remember some of the vivid stories that never left my mind. A person called me one time and he said, I watched you the first time when I was seven. I started 2006, so he was seven back then. And he said, um, I didn't understand, but I understood one thing. My dad was mad when he was watching you. And he was, he was just cursing you every name that comes to his mouth, he called you. And he said, one time I grew up and I was searching on Facebook and then your image, your face comes and I said, hey, here is the guy that got my dad used to curse. And he said, I started watching your videos, one after the other. Then I understood why my, why, why my dad was mad at you. And he said, now I just want to confess and give my life to Jesus Christ. And he did. Even my family members, many of them, when they rejected me after that, especially my siblings, they saw, they saw how committed and how I'm willing to risk everything. One time my youngest brother, he told me, why you are doing this? I understand you became a Christian, but why you are going on TV and sharing it? I told him, if I don't do it, who's going to do it? If we, who know the truth, will not do it, who's going to do it? And he said, you might be killed. I said, so? We believe that Jesus died for us, so our lives are not more precious than his. If we really believe in that. And then he said, how can I give my life to Jesus Christ? I was out of Morocco back then, so I sent a believer whom I know to him and he baptized him in Morocco. Many, many stories. What's the conclusion? We have a strong gospel that saves. It has the power of God. We have a strong message. We have a strong case. Islam looks like a giant Goliath. Two billions and a half of Muslims. Many political correctness. People do not want to talk about Islam because it will upset so many people. So it's our duty as a church to face that Goliath. Yeah, our resources are less than Saudi Arabia and the Gulf area. They have a lot of money to put mosques everywhere, to preach Islam everywhere. But, but we believe in a God who made David bring Goliath down. Our God is strong enough to bring any doctrine, false doctrine against Christianity down. Islam just has the look, the appearance. But when you dig deep, it's very weak. It's a very weak worldview. It cannot hold up together. The image of God is one of the things that we can compare and make Muslims compare to see the difference. I have done probably more than 300 interviews with former Muslims who became Christians. I always ask a question in the middle. 
What was the turning point? What made you make the decision and become a Christian? Always it comes down to two things, love and God being a father. Because they don't have it, we don't have it in Islam. So if, if we present this loving God, if we present this God who is our father, we pray to him, we say our father in heaven, I'm 100% sure many lives will be changed. One time, one lady, she came to me and she was crying and she said, I live in Egypt and I'm, I'm so mad. I'm a Christian now, I love the Islam, but I'm so mad because my neighbors, none of them dare to talk to me about Christ all these years. I said, because they're afraid. They're not safe there. Their churches are burned. They are attacked every time. So they don't dare to share the gospel. She said, yes, but they had the truth. They could have just told me and I could have saved myself many years that I spent and they are lost in my life. As we speak today, there is a guy in Libya. He is arrested. Is he condemned for death? He's on a death row right now because he became a believer watching YouTube videos and social media. They asked him to renounce Jesus, embrace Islam again, he refused. We have to pray for him and we have also to use all our connections to get him free. So if, if Muslims are willing to risk their lives following Jesus Christ, I think it's a challenge for us, especially the ones who live in the West, to share the gospel. It will not cost you your life. It will not cost you what it costs them. Last story I'm going to share from Saudi Arabia. One time there was a famous guy, was, uh, he got arrested in 2012 for writing something criticizing Islam. So they arrested him and they sentenced him for a thousand lashes, 10 years of prison, and 10 years not to leave the country after being released from prison. He just got released this year, but he still, he cannot leave the country. When he was in prison, somebody smuggled him a cell phone. I got the number, I called him. He was in prison and I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm all right. And I said, how can I pray for you? He said, just pray I stay strong. I said, what can you tell me? He said, Brother Rashid, you are famous in the prison here. <laughs> I said, how? He said, well, every Thursday I turn on my cell phone and we watch you all together. <laughs> I was amazed. And he told me this, I didn't say anything. I was like, I, I couldn't absorb it at the moment. I told him, that's really great to hear. Because I was feeling for him, I didn't expect him to share anything like that. And then he said, you know, in the darkest place in the world, in the darkest place, in that darkest place, there is a light. So imagine in a prison, inside a prison, still God reaches Muslims. So a challenge for us today to pray for Muslims, to reach out to Muslims, to stand behind ministries who are trying to reach Muslims. Many times I went to conferences and I shared, we share numbers, how many people watched us, how many people followed us on Facebook, how many people, and I said this, for many organizations, they are just numbers. When we talk about how many, just numbers. But for me, they are my dad, my mom, my family. Imagine your own siblings are gonna lose their eternity 
wouldn't, do, wouldn't you do anything to bring salvation to them? So this is what I'm putting you in front today. Imagine your son, your daughter, your dad, your brother, your sister is losing eternity. Wouldn't you do anything to give them a hand to save them? So thank you so much for allowing me this. And God bless you all. Let's have a quick prayer. Thank you, Lord, for being who you are. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you, Lord, for sending your son to die for us on the cross. So many times we take these things for granted. So many times we don't feel the value of these things. But thank you for showing us how precious we are in your eyes. I pray for my sisters and my brothers in the Middle East that you open their hearts and their minds. I pray for every soul in this room that you bless each one of us and make us a shining light, a salt in this world, a vessel of love. In Jesus' name, amen.